I'm Melissa Phillips. Um, I work as a data scientist at CCRI, um, which is a local geospatial data science company, which means we work with um, anything you can put on a map, basically. And today I'm going to talk through uh, one of my first projects there during my internship, which was working with AIS data, which um, is sent out from vessels, so ships, um, basically all types of ships. And um, we were looking for port boundaries, so places where the vessels would stop. Um, we had an index that has a lat long, so it's basically one dot on a map for each port. And we wanted to understand better the boundaries around the port. And so we were using the data itself to help us understand that, knowing that we could kind of run an algorithm on it, uh, on the data later on and see how port boundaries might change over time as well. So uh, that's part of why we would use machine learning for a task like that. Um, so this is just a Jupyter notebook that I put together, um, replicating some of the work I did. This isn't um, my actual notebook, um, so some of it's just kind of from memory, just remembering how we ran through the task. The data that I'm using here is AIS data, so from ships. Um, I found some online at Marine Cadastre, um, which was free, and you can find that as well if you want to play with this kind of data. I was reading in a CSV, and so we can see the head of the CSV here. Um, it's always good to kind of just check it out and see what's coming in there. Um, MIMSI is a special number for each vessel that kind of uniquely identifies it. You usually got a timestamp and lat long, so you have your coordinates. SOG is speed over ground, COG is course over ground, um, and you have your heading as well. And frequently have a name, but you can see lots of times we have nulls in these areas. IMO is also another unique identifier in theory. But of course, all of these zeros, um, that goes to show that that's not actually giving us any information. And then we get a lot of details about the ship itself. But for this task, we really, we want to think about when ships are stopped. So the main thing for us will be this SOG, uh, which is a knot, so speed over ground. And we want to see when our vessels are slow, um, so usually less than 0.5 knots. Um, there's just some data cleaning here. So because of all those nulls and features that you know, weren't giving us any, any information, we just kind of dropped them. Um, I just dropped any along the rows, but you can get more technical than that. Um, if you, since we know we want speed over ground, we might want to drop anything that wasn't um, that has a null here. Otherwise, we would keep it and maybe just not hold on to some of these other values that aren't um, giving us any use for this project. Um, frequently, we'll map in a different um, environment. So here, I'm just doing an easy matplotlib plot, which is just a quick and dirty way to see where things are. And we can see like these vessels are kind of, there's a few clusters up here and some down here. And that's for all the vessels in this particular data frame. Um, for this task, we want to limit for just the very slow and stopped vessels. And we want to start to kind of cluster those. So as I said before, we want to reduce the speed down to only vessels where we're less than 0.5 knots. Um, and then I reduce that here. And so we can see the head of that data frame. Since we already dropped those nulls, it looks a lot cleaner than the one we saw before. And here I'm just kind of exploring a little bit at the ranges of the lats and longs. So depending on your computing power, um, you might need to limit your data sets. And this is an, a way to do it. We want to, um, for me, I wanted to limit it somewhat geographically just to kind of cut down on how much I was going to be processing. Um, here's another scatter plot just showing the slow vessels from that data frame. Um, looking here about how big the data frame is to, for plotting purposes. I wanted to use something called Folium, which is nice. It'll actually give you a map view, and, um, but it's kind of finicky when you use it. So at CCRI, we actually have a user interface that we can use and we can observe these OBS a lot more quickly than this. But when I started, I wasn't using that and I was using um, Folium and Python and it was okay, but it's, um, it is a little bit hard to use at times because it can be so finicky. But when you get it to work, it's a really nice view. Um, here I'm reducing by the geographical bounds that I chose. And so I was just kind of looking along here and trying to see where I could limit things um, so that I wasn't processing too much. For the actual task that we did, we wanted it eventually to be all over the world. And we tried it two different ways. One was getting data all, all over the world, pulling it for a certain length of time, and then just running clustering algorithms on that. And the other one was kind of going port by port. So finding a geographical location and pulling the data around there for a period of time and then iterating through that and clustering that way. In the end, the better one was kind of doing it worldwide, but it sometimes you know, will be part of your job to kind of figure out which way is better and just to try them both out and, and see which gives better results. So here we're reducing again. I'm looking at the head, it looks good. Um, just plotting it, it looks very similar to the one before. This is when I was trying to do the folia map and it was just taking really long, so didn't stick with that. 
Um, and here's where we start doing some of the clustering um, machine learning piece of this. There are different clustering uh, methodologies that you can use. So one that you'll learn about early on in your data science career is called k-means, um, which is nice for when things are kind of Cartesian um, using a, that sort of a distance metric. The thing with geospatial data you have to always remember is like anytime you're measuring any length of distance, you have to take into account the curvature of the Earth. And so you want a, an algorithm that takes that into account. So I'm just importing some of the things that we're going to need for this. We have a distance with the great circle distance that's around the Earth, any kind of full rotation, um, full diameter of the Earth is the great circle distance. And um, when we're using Haversine, which is what I was talking about, a, a distance metric that takes into account the curvature of the Earth, we need to move things into radians. So this here, kilometers per radian, is going to help us make that conversion. And dbscan kind of works in that it finds um, like a cluster point and, and looks within a certain distance for neighbors and clusters them together and, and will then label these clusters appropriately so you can see what was made. Um, so the, a big parameter to tune is this epsilon value here. So we have it in kilometers and then we're going to turn it into radians by dividing by kilometers per radian. And so this is, again, something we have to tune. So we just kind of try out a few different values and depending on what your task might be, you might have to go through this a few times and get a sense of if it's working well for your data or not. So here I'll have an example of 1.5 kilometers per radian, and we got 50 clusters. So that means in our data set here that we had before, this algorithm is finding 50 different clusters out of that and marking them, which means that the, all, of, all of those clusters are going to be quite small. And when we look intuitively at the data, and especially if we had a map background, you might be able to see generally where the ports should be. And that's probably too many clusters. So we can know that maybe that epsilon value is a bit too small. So um, here's a second iteration where I choose an epsilon value of 20 kilometers and run that through. And I'm getting 21 clusters, which I think is a bit better. Um, I've decided to plot that as well, just using another um, plotting library called Seaborn, uh, just so I could get those labels on there a little bit more. So we have 21, and we can kind of see how these clusters are forming. Um, I would expect maybe like a cluster here, maybe a cluster down here, but I'm seeing lots of different colors in these places. So again, I don't feel like that's the best that we can do. And so I might want to modify and try a different value again for epsilon. So I picked a bigger value of 100. And when I run that through, I'm getting 10 clusters out. And again, I will look at those labels and plot them and see. And so this is more what I would expect. So I, I am seeing some kind of stray clusters that are forming, but I'm seeing like this nice orange one over here and this green one. It's kind of intuitively what I would be expecting from the way I saw the data. And then of course you would want to correlate that with any information you know about ports. So if we had had that port index, like I mentioned before that we did have, um, there might be like one port dot here and one port dot here. And then I would know, okay, those are the actual ports that I'm working with. And I would want to take these uh, labeled points and have them form a polygon. And then that would be the boundaries of my port. So I could take this cluster, um, if that was a port, and turn that into some kind of polygon shape, and then the same thing here. And then maybe we'd have found that maybe one of these was a port, it was just a lot smaller. And so we do the same with any kind of cluster that was actually um, located where the index was for that port. So in terms of next steps, I mean, we could still keep trying different values of epsilon until we get to the right range that makes intuitive sense and that works for our data. And then we'd want to create those polygons and it's not hard to do that. So in GeoPandas, you can um, kind of have your data frame of the index for the ports and, and um, put them together with an intersection with the data frame that we have here with our labels and actually create shapes right in GeoPandas. And then, um, yeah, we want to choose the polygons that intersect with that port that we have. And then from there, we'll probably clean this all up because this is really, really rough and fast and then write some sort of report and communicating that. And in our use case, we actually um, moved that port boundaries into our um, user interface and they were using that for port route mapping as well. So once you had the ports, you could figure out, okay, well, if a vessel starts there and ends at another port, what do those routes look like? And then they started building predictive models off of that. So this is a nice kind of easy task, but there are you know, some challenging parts to it, like trying to find that right epsilon value and then trying to you know, hook those up with the right port indices. But then it gets really fun afterward and there's a lot of uh, extension projects after that. Thanks.